Venice, 1442. The Venetian cartographer Giovanni Leardo signs his map, lays down his pen. The map is a masterpiece. You can see Asia, Europe, Africa. Leardo has depicted the whole of the known world, stretching from the far east to the Atlantic, the Northern Hemisphere. Leardo is an accurate map maker. The map highly detailed. Leardo has used travel accounts of trustworthy explorers, Marco Polo, for example. Place names in Africa and the Far East come from Ptolemy's geography. Leardo has taken the outlines of the Mediterranean Sea and Europe from a nautical chart. But there is something puzzling here. Paradiso Terresto, Paradise on Earth, New India. How could an accurate map maker include on a modern map of the world Paradise on Earth? And why near India? It all started because of the Bible. The first chapter of the book of Genesis records how God completed his work in six days and how on the sixth God created man in his own image, male and female. There is another more detailed account of the creation of man later in the second chapter of Genesis. God formed man from the dust of the ground. God breathed life into his nostrils. Man became a living being, Adam. God created a garden for Adam, the Garden of Eden. All kinds of trees grew there, and in the middle, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed from Eden to water the garden and divided into four branches the Pison, the Gihon, the Tigris, the Euphrates. Adam needed a mate, so God sent Adam into a deep sleep, removed one of his ribs, and shaped a woman from it. A woman called Eve. But as we all know, Adam and Eve sinned and they were expelled from the Garden of Eden, they and their progeny forever. This story has excited very different readings, conflicting interpretations, but it was Augustine in the fifth century who promoted the birth of a notion, the notion of a paradise on earth, the specific place where Adam and Eve enjoy their bliss. For Augustine, there was a single instantaneous creation out of time, impossible to understand, described in the first chapter of Genesis as a week, so a mystery out of time, followed by a creation within time, described in the second chapter of Genesis. For Augustine, it was important to stress that the paradise narrative in the second chapter of Genesis accounted for real facts, that it was all true. Adam and Eve were a real man, a real woman in the flesh, perfect, corporeal, immortal, placed in a real, a material paradise. Equally real were the four rivers. They flowed from a single source in the middle of the Garden of Eden, traveled underground, emerged into the known regions of the earth. The Gihon was the Nile that watered Egypt. The Pison was the Ganges that crossed India. The Tigris and the Euphrates flowed through Mesopotamia. This is the oldest detailed map of the world featuring paradise. And you will notice that I'm using the terms Garden of Eden 
and earthly paradise interchangeably. But it's important to bear in mind that I'm not talking about the ultimate paradise, heaven. We are talking about paradise on earth. And this is the very first map featuring paradise on earth. Below, in the lower part of the map, we see places such as Delos, Carthage, Rome, Constantinople, the provinces of the Roman Empire. Above, above we see Jerusalem, Babylon, Mount Sinai, the River Jordan, the Red Sea crossing, and here, in the far east, a rosette labelled Paradisus, Paradise, the Garden of Eden mentioned in the book of Genesis, located in the Far East, beyond India, as in the map by Giovanni Leardo that we saw at the beginning. Why? Because of this word, of this Hebrew word, in the Hebrew version of Genesis, we read that God placed the Garden of Eden, Gan Eden, Mikedem. Mikedem to me is a fascinating word. Mikedem refers to both time and space. Mikedem describes both when and where God placed the Garden of Eden. At the beginning, at the dawn of time, in the east in the sunrise of space. Jerome, in his famous Latin translation, the Vulgate, chose to render the Hebrew Mikedem temporally. For Jerome, the earthly paradise had been created at the beginning. But some other translators choose to give the expression Mikedem its spatial meaning. The Greek translation circulating in the early centuries of Christianity, known as the Septuagint, and the Vetus Latina, the old Latin translation, indicated that God planted the Garden of Eden in the east. Isidore, Bishop of Seville, 7th century. Paradise is a place in the east, always temperate, now inaccessible surrounded on all sides by a wall of fire, reaching almost to heaven. Bede, the scholar monk from Northumbria, 8th century, the Garden of Eden was and is on earth, somewhere in the east, separate from the rest of the world by a vast expanse of land or sea, on a mountain so high that he had escaped the flood and a place not far from India. Because the book of Genesis described the land of Avila, bordering Eden and surrounded by the river Pison, which is the Ganges, as a land rich in gold. And Bede noticed that Pliny the Elder had stated that India was rich in gold. Then Avila, near the Garden of Eden, is the region in India. This map we find paradise in the east, here, not far from India. The idea that God placed the Garden of Eden Mikedem, both in time and space, that paradise was both an event, the fall of Adam and Eve at the beginning of history, and a place, the region of the earth in the furthest east, that paradise was an event place, that notion provided the foundation for many renditions of the Garden of Eden on maps in the Latin Middle Ages. Maps such as this one. On the Ebstof map, Christ holds the whole world in his hands. His head is visible in the east at the top of the map, his two feet are in the west. His outstretched hands appear on either side of the earth, north and south. In the east, near the head of Christ, in the east, 
beyond India, in a mysterious place surrounded on all sides by mountains, near the outer ocean, we find the Garden of Eden. The garden described in the book of Genesis, you see the tree of life with the four rivers, Adam, Eve, the serpent, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So there was a tradition about the earthly existence of the Garden of Eden. And we find the essentials about this tradition in two highly influential 12th century texts, the anonymous Glossa Ordinaria and the Sentenze by Peter Lombard. And we find the essentials about Eden according to medieval tradition also on maps. And what are these essentials? Paradise was a real place on earth, inaccessible because of original sin, yet connected to the inhabited world through the four rivers. The Garden of Eden was out of sight, but very probably situated somewhere in Eastern Asia, at a very high altitude, untouched by the flood. This is the Soli world map. This is my drawing. Here again, East is found at the top of the map. The four rivers issuing from a single source in Paradise are the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Gihon and the Pison. As we said, identify the latter as the Nile and the Ganges. These four rivers, according to medieval tradition, flowed out from the garden, run underground through mysterious routes to re-emerge their known sources. In Assyria, the Tigris, in Mesopotamia, the Euphrates, in Africa, through the, the Sahara and Egypt, the Nile, in India, the Ganges. So the idea was that these great four rivers came from paradise to water the earth, to make possible life on earth. The Garden of Eden was believed to still exist on earth. The Garden of Eden could be shown on maps of the world. These maps are typically orientated with east at the top. That people in the Middle Ages believed the earth was flat is a modern myth, it's completely false, it's a fake news. They perfectly knew that the earth was a sphere. What you see here is the known part of the earth in the northern hemisphere. The Hereford map depicts the different parts of the known world, Asia, Europe, Africa. The map, this map is laid out in a typical structure shared by many maps from the period, which is called TO maps, where O is the circle of the inhabited Earth and T is the letter formed by the lines of the river Tanais, the Don, dividing Europe from Asia, the river Nile, dividing Africa from Asia, the Mediterranean Sea dividing Europe from Africa. So in Europe, this is Venice. And this is Dublin. The Hereford map may seem a bit strange, a bit weird to modern eyes, may seem picturesque to you because you see, for example, here fabulous animals. You see sirens. You see monsters. You see the outlines of countries, of seas, rivers, all distorted compared to modern standards. And then above all you see here an imaginary garden the paradise of Adam and Eve. This is a 19th century facsimile. We also find other scenes from the Bible, not only the Garden of Eden. 
And we find also scenes from history. Here, for example, we see the Ark of Noah in the mountains of Armenia. Here, the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt to the Promised Land. Not only the stories of the Bible, also the stories of classical antiquity. Here, for example, we see the camps of Alexander the Great. So many scholars, especially in the 19th century and the early 20th century, dismiss this map as superstitious, uh, bizarre, unscientific. No, the author of the Hereford map knew very well what he was doing. For example, he knew that space cannot exist without time. Even our digital space tonight, our Zoom meeting, would not exist without this evening, without our experience of this talk in time, however different may be our time zones. Space and time are combined on the Hereford map. The Hereford map shows the, the events where they happened. So it's a cartography following its own principles, scientific in its own terms. The point that space and time are interdependent, the geographical space is the stage upon which history is played out, had been made in the 12th century by Hugh of Saint Victor, an important theologian and exegete. And we know that the vision of Hugh had an impact on medieval cartography. According to Hugh, God planned the sequence of historical events as running from east to west. The most important events, according to a global perspective, followed, according to Hugh, the daily course of the sun. They proceeded from the Orient to the Occident, from Eden, from the early kingdoms in the east, to the Roman Empire in the west to the Passion of Christ in Jerusalem, at the center of geography, at the center of history. The sequence of history through geography, and this is Hugh explaining, this sequence had reached Western Europe, had reached the Mediterranean basin, the extreme west. So the end of the world as space when humankind was about to reach the end of the world as time. And in this geography ruled by history, the Garden of Eden is a place that belongs to the past, but also a place that belongs to the earth. This map is not unscientific. This map just tells us that the island of paradise is outside the inhabited Earth, next to the most eastern region of Asia, because here the governing principle is contiguity. Here, mathematical accuracy of distance, accuracy of, dis of direction, is irrelevant. Exactly like in this map. This map has not been drawn to mathematical scale, but according to the topological principle of contiguity. That which is next to something is shown as next to it. The same principle on medieval maps. On this map, paradise is an island here, an island contiguous to the inhabited regions of the earth, connected to the known earth through the four rivers, but at the same time separated by a wall of fire or by inaccessible mountains. A place on earth, but not of the earth. And yet the rivers that flowed from Eden, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Nile, the Ganges, were very much of the earth. On this map, Paradise is the first region in the east, 
a large rectangular inset superimposed on Eastern Asia beyond India. And this is the fall, the very first historical event, the barrier in time preventing us from paradise. Paradise is lost in a past nowhere. But this nowhere is on earth. This nowhere had to be somewhere. But somewhere where? Perhaps somewhere in Eastern Asia? In the early centuries of Christianity, no Christian scholar had ventured to suggest exactly where paradise was. But in the 13th century, the problem of the location of the terrestrial paradise took on even greater importance because there was a revival in astronomical geography, there was an intellectual revolution, there was the rediscovery of Aristotle, there were the Arab commentators of Aristotle just introduced to the West. There were so many new geographical data, new astronomical data. This is a zonal map, south at the top, and the five climatic belts encircling the Earth. Too frigid, too temperate, and a torrid zone along the equator. Where was paradise to be found? On the equator, north of the equator, south of the equator, medieval scholars failed to reach a consensus. No theologian, no geographer managed to offer the last word on where was Eden. It was impossible to associate paradise, a place with a perpetual, a perpetually temperate weather, with any of the climatic zones. This map demonstrates really in a striking manner the way in which the Garden of Eden was believed simultaneously to exist on Earth and yet to be a different region outside the inhabited Earth, outside its climatic division. The map is orientated to the south. The map represents the terrestrial sphere and shows the five climatic zones. This circle represents the inhabited Earth. Paradise is represented by a large rectangle drawn below the terrestrial globe. The rectangle appears to touch the spherical globe, but it is shown on a different plane. Paradise is separated from the Earth, from its climatic division, and only the four rivers of paradise indicated and named on the rectangle connect the two planes, two planes which are otherwise unconnectable. By the beginning of the 15th century, the stage was set for major changes in cartography, which corresponded to crucial changes in the thinking about paradise. Various factors were involved. The flood of new information about distant parts of the world, most especially about Asia and the Far East. The shift of the center of gravity of book and map production away from the rural monastic scriptoria to the university towns and mercantile cities. The appearance in the Mediterranean world by the beginning of the 13th century of an entirely new kind of map the nautical chart, the rediscovery of Ptolemy's geography. The appearance in the world of navigation of the nautical chart, possibly around 1200, introduced a completely different cartographical mindset. Nautical charts were made for practical use to guide navigation. As you may see from this image, the charts portray the coastlines of Europe, of Africa, with great accuracy, because sailors had to work out the shortest compass course between different places. And the nautical charts were often copied by those compiling world maps. Here, the crisscrossing lines of nautical chart cover every part of the known Earth into a network of measurable directions. Medieval world maps had been historical representations. Remote non-European lands were regions of the past. 
but maritime cartography offered the compilers of Mappe Mundi of world maps a new perspective to represent Asia, Africa as contemporary, taking information from Arabic maps, from geographical tables, from the accounts of European travelers. Paradise continued to be a feature on maps throughout the 15th century, placed variously in Asia or in Africa, but locating places in mathematical relationship to each other meant that the map sign for the Garden of Eden was altered from pointing to an event place just to pointing to a place. The Garden of Eden had to be described much more precisely than in traditional topological terms, saying simply that it was next to the inhabited earth was no longer enough. On this list of coordinates of latitude and longitude, the first place is paradise. Paradisus in medio mundi. Paradise in the middle of the world, at the equator. Note the coordinates. Paradise on Earth. Latitude, zero degrees, the prime parallel, the equator. Longitude, 180 degrees, the prime meridian, true east. The Walschberger map incorporated medieval features, but also showed the new concern for measured distance and direction. Instructions are given here for calculating the position of places, for calculating the distances between places using the scale bar. But paradise is still in Asia, here. Walschberger color coded his place signs red for Christian cities, black for non Christian cities. So paradise is surrounded by the non-Christian places of contemporary Asia, by the Mongolian Empire, by Cathay. The move towards quantified, towards mathematical mapping, was forcing European map makers to confront the unanswerable question, what is the exact location of the earthly paradise? On the Catalan Estense world map, the earthly paradise is depicted in the Horn of Africa within a dense network of lines taken from nautical charts. Here space is no longer structured by history. Fra Mauro, a Camaldoli's Venetian monk, intended to describe the regions of his own day, not to chart the process of history. Framauro showed the contemporary, the inhabited earth in the main circle of his map. But the vignette of the earthly paradise is placed outside the circle in the bottom left corner, because paradise belonged to an inaccessible eastern nowhere, not to somewhere in the known world. Paradise was inaccessible, distanced in the past, on a different plane than the contemporary inhabited earth, which is portrayed in the main map. That's why it is outside. Around 1500, the idea that paradise existed in the past was taken in a more explicit, in a more exclusive way. This is the first complete edition of Luther's translation of the Bible, published in 1534, and we see this woodcut of the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve stand naked in a pleasant landscape. This is the primordial Eden of the past. For Luther, radically different from the fallen earth of the present. 
Here, God blesses Eden and the earth. But after the fall, God cursed Eden, cursed the earth. Eden lost its fertility. Mankind lost its Eden. According to Luther, a barren Eden survived on earth, guarded by the cherubim. But the flood wiped out the remains of Eden. This is the tragedy of human sin. Paradise was cursed, paradise was flooded, paradise was no more. And the change from paradise present to paradise past is mirrored in maps. From about 1500 onwards, no map of the world showed the earthly paradise. On a map of the world, ruled by measurable coordinates, defined by astronomical time, giving measured, correctly proportioned distances between places. On a map mirroring the surface of the contemporary inhabited known Earth, where space was homogeneous, co-synchronous, ordered by a geometrical grid, there was no room for a paradise on Earth, a place belonging to the past. Moreover, after 1500, Maps no longer presented a stable image of the world, a stable image into which the history of salvation could be incorporated, as in the medieval tradition. Maps had to take into account the geographical discoveries. A new world was being discovered. This map is the first to show the coast of the new world and one of the last to include paradise which on this map is in Africa, with a very complex iconography that I don't have the time to discuss now. So after 1500, paradise could be included only on those regional maps that refer to a geography of the past. And these were maps drawn to illustrated printed Bibles to form historical atlases. Here, paradise is in Mesopotamia. Medieval compilers of maps had mapped the Garden of Eden because of its historical importance and simply suggesting its contiguity to the inhabited earth. Renaissance mapmakers defined the location of paradise with Ptolemaic precision, with latitude, longitude. Paradise could be located, could be measured with exactitude, Paradise was found on earth, but was lost in the past. And it was the theology of John Calvin which allowed paradise to be sketched on a regional map, showing its position in a particular area of the world. For Calvin, man had sinned. Man felt despair. Man needed a sign, a sign of order amidst chaos, a sign of love. And Calvin pointed to that sign. Calvin mapped that sign in Mesopotamia. For Calvin, true, paradise had vanished because of sin. But Calvin mapped the rivers of paradise still flowing in Mesopotamia. So the archaeological remains of the Garden of Eden of Adam and Eve could now be located in a very precise way on earth. The medieval paradise was still there, but distant in the remote east. The modern paradise was within reach, but no longer there, distant in the remote past. And this new, the this historical regional mapping of the Garden of Eden began at the time of the Reformation and has blossomed until today. Paradise, for example, is a huge region in the Middle East, according to Matthäus Beroaldus. A small garden near Babylon, according to John Hopkinson. A square garden in Mesopotamia, according to Athanasius Kircher. 
a wide grove near the Persian Gulf, according to Pierre Daniel Huet. A garden now entirely covered by the Persian Gulf, according to Paul Wright. One of the Seychelles Islands, according to General Gordon. A garden in northwest Iran, according to the archaeologist David Rawl. A place in the Hunza Valley, northern Pakistan, according to Italian mathematics lecturer Emilio Spedicato. Where is nowhere? This is always the question. So I So Alessandro, I think you closed this super fascinating uh, journey through maps. I think we are all totally fascinated by what you told us. And uh, I was wondering if there were questions from uh, our public. I, I haven't seen anybody asking questions in the chat, but uh, uh, we will be delighted to uh, to hear from you. I, I was wondering, I mean, this sort of fingerprint print of human needs uh, uh, seems to be represented by maps uh, and it hasn't finished. I think it was uh, absolutely fascinating to see that this uh, trying to find paradise on earth uh, has continued until the 21st century and uh, it is not something that has stopped in fact. And I was wondering if this was uh, what uh, um, made you start this research when you started working on maps? <laughs> yes, I can uh, break the ice of our conversation by saying that, yes, when I was a, a young student, I've been always fascinated by this human yearning from for another world, for a better world, for utopian visions. And working on the topic of the ideal city in the Renaissance, I came across footnotes saying that people in the Middle Ages were so naive, so bizarre, that they even mapped the Garden of Eden. And I couldn't accept the idea that our predecessors were so stupid, why we should be much more clever. And I think we live in times of arrogant presentism, where people destroy statues because they people some morals are no longer trendy so we have a very troubled relationship with the past and i then began to work on that and i can uh, report to you that when i was actually as always i've been uh, traveling between italy and england because i'm italian but then i've been associated with the war book where I found a wonderful library where I could write and pursue my own scholarly search for paradise. So I remember I was in London when I ordered the reproductions of many of the maps you've seen tonight that are kept in the Vatican Library. And then I asked the photographic service to reproduce for me the whole map and the detail of the earthly paradise. And then I'd been, I was waiting for an answer. And then after a few weeks, a family member rang me from Rome and, and, and said that the Vatican Library has ranked in Rome and they are very anxious because they were able to locate the maps, but they were unable to find the location of the earthly paradise. <laughs> so I thought if in the Vatican they don't know where paradise on earth is someone has to work on that, someone has to, <laughs> to at least reconstruct in historical fashion the attempts to locate it or to represent it. Yes, and in fact, there are already two questions uh, connected with, uh, you know, looking for a place for paradise. So Michael Collins asks um, whether 
you can tell us something about Dante's idea of where paradise was, and then, which is probably different from, you know, the Garden of Eden, but, and then Peter Langdale asks, uh, uh, says actually, I think I understood a moment in the 13th century when the Garden of Eden was in the south. Was I right to see a link with where Dante places it on the Mount of Purgatory? Indeed, actually, I, I, I try to refrain myself because it would take another series of lectures. Lectures, because of course I, I'm I'm a passionate uh, student of Dante. Well, Dante, in actually, I, I mentioned earlier that in the 19th century people were dismissive and thought that these maps were rubbish and that their own maps were better. But this, on the exception of Dante scholars, 19th century Dante scholars, I think in particular some Italian 19th century writers, they took this thing seriously because they thought if Dante believed in paradise on earth, and so I found some, of course, dated studies, but decent studies on, on maps, on paradise on maps, done by Dante scholars. What Dante thought about the Garden of Eden? Dante, to cut a very long story short, was a great poet that was able to um, steal material from his sources and then make them very Dantesque. So it's always very difficult to identify, in this case, which author he has studied and how he has developed his idea. In short, Dante believed that the Garden of Eden was located in the southern unknown hemisphere at the top of the mountain of Purgatory at the exact antipodes of Jerusalem, surrounded by the ocean so much that Ulysses famously tried to reach it and he, he was uh, shipwrecked in a storm because no man is allowed without the grace of God to approach the shores of the mountain and then the peak of the mountain is Eden. And this idea to locate paradise in the southern hemisphere was current in the Middle Ages. I had to cut a long story short in my presentation, but people argued, especially after the intellectual revolution of the 13th century, whether the Garden of Eden was at the equator or south of the equator. And people such as Roger Bacon and uh, other Bonaventure and other uh, intellectuals at the time, they thought it was in the southern hemisphere. Of course, Dante used these geographical notions to build up his poetic imagery. I found a particular author that I I had in mind to present to you tonight, but there was no time. I prefer to cut it short my presentation so we would have more time for discussion. And this author is called Alexander of Hales. He is a very interesting case of the intellectual bravery of these 13th century Christian theologians who not only didn't fear to face the new science, the science, and also proves to us that it is not necessary that science goes against religion. They accepted the challenge, they embraced Aristotle, and Alexander of Hales provided a very consistent scientific theory based on Aristotle on the altitude of the Garden of Eden. And I found in Dante very similar statements. One of the idea of Alexander Hayes was that the middle region of the air where storms, rains and originate, according to Aristotle, was found below the peak of the mountain, which was above the vapors. And Dante used this very expression in purgatory. Apart from the fact that it locates the garden on the top of the mountain, which as I mentioned, was a, a feature in traditional medieval uh, tradition. Um, even though Bede, uh, who I mentioned, claimed that the mountain was so high to teach this, to reach this field of the moon. I don't know whether you have in, in your mind the Ptolemaic universe, but this field of the moon is extremely high. So later scholars began to doubt this. In the 13th century, they began to say, no, it's not possible because 
this would be upset all the equilibrium of the planet. We would see a huge shadow that we don't see. It's impossible. So they began to have other theories that what is meant by these traditional ideas was that the mountain of purgatory did not reach the sphere of the moon, but was high enough to enjoy the same weather condition of the circle of the moon. So the, in, you see, in scientific terms, it's the same, to me, fascinating uh, notion. And that's to, again, answer uh, Renata, because I've been always fascinated by this struggle to imagine a heavenly earth. This mountain is, stretches, uh, is the mountain that stretches highest from the earth to heaven. And this is an earthly heaven or a heavenly earth on the peak of this mountain sharing the same uh, features of the heavens and still anchored on earth. Well, which perhaps leads us uh, to the question, a wonderful question by Aileen Nikulinan, which you'll probably see, but John Dunn wrote in the 1620s, we think that Paradise and Calvary stood in one place. And yeah. she wonders whether you have come across this idea. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This is, a, 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 again, a traditional medieval idea. In fact, I could uh, tell the, the, the person who asked this question that then I've been, as I said, I began working on the Renaissance and then I discovered <laughs> that there was a very long tradition of many things that I found in the Renaissance and I began to go backwards. So the idea of John Donne, it was a typical medieval way to relate the events uh, accounted for in the book in the Old Testament to the New Testament. To, to uh, this is a simple, the idea to um, link the first Adam and the second Adam Christ, the sin of Adam and the redemption of Christ. There is no, again, another thing that I come to realize is that we need to respect the past as a foreign country. And is, I've read often this very simplistic account of medieval uh, spirituality and things. The, um, you, the shame of Adam and Eve must not be uh, considered without the counterpart of the redemption of Christ. The, the, two, the two poles in Christianity, they uh, balance each other. Uh, the sin is a Felix culpa. That's why uh, with beautiful poetic intuition, uh, Dante put Jerusalem at the antipode of the mountain of purgatory and Garden of Eden. The tradition that the cross of Christ was on the very place of the buried of Adam is demonstrated by many paintings in the Western tradition. When you see the Christ crucified Christ on a painting, very often you find a skull at the base of the cross with the blood of Christ um, falling on the skull. And this is a visual uh, demonstration how the, the redemption of Christ healed the first sin and it was the death of death, as Augustine put it. So indeed, there is a long, long, uh, century-long tradition about linking uh, the Calvary and, 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 and Adam and the burial of Adam. And they also a legend, for example, the, the journey of Seth, a fascinating corpus. Well, the, the second part of your book deals also with uh, modern contemporary, I would say, uh, visions, maps. And I was wondering, you know, the space, we shape the space according to our beliefs. Uh, uh, are we aware of which beliefs lead our modern representation of space? I mean, we can see it in the past because we decided to focus on, and we, are, we have evidence that we can focus on uh, religion, in fact. What we can focus on? Focus on the history of redemption and... Yes. What is your question? What is it that makes us represent space nowadays? What is the leading... Yes. Well, um, what was interesting to me from an historical point of view and to see how this issue of locating the Garden of Eden was really a burning issue up to the 17th century. Because up to that time, the Christian shared belief was that Moses wrote a book of Genesis inspired by God, 
So if Moses wrote that there was a garden in the east, according to that translation, with the four rivers, there must be a garden in the east because you must acknowledge the literal truth of the Bible. Around 1700, scholars began to discover that the Bible, in particular the book of Genesis, was not a uniform document. It, would, it came from different traditions. Scholars began to dissect the text and to discover that it is a text that had a history. So even biblical scholars, Christian uh, theologians, changed their mind about the burning issue. They thought this description has, was influenced by the culture of that time. For us, it has just a spiritual meaning. And this is again uh, to emphasize how difficult it is for us to understand the past. Because for, for us, for any Christians, the Bible is just a spiritual and religious book. I opened the Bible to be inspired in my spiritual life, but not to find out about the geography of the space, the astronomy. Since the since 1700s, people stopped to see the Bible as the Bible, the book, containing all knowledge. And this was the issue for Garden of Eden. So today, certainly, we are not concerned any longer about how to corroborate the authority, the authority of Scripture. And very interestingly, um, at the, since even at the time, I think, of Milton, uh, there was a, in, in, in scholastic theology, already with John Dan Scotus in the 14th century, there was a gradual shift from earth to heaven, a tendency to spiritualize the human perfection, which to me is fascinating. I'm working on that in my own in my current research. So how, so today, to answer your question, it has, it is, it seems that uh, we are locked on earth. It's pretty difficult to find ways out. And when I, um, Katya is, is there and she knows because I'm running this Dante uh, series at the Italian Institute of Culture in London. And my point, I think, was uh, last Tuesday was exactly that now, if we talk about Dante in the popular culture, Dante is inferno. Mm. So we don't have any o opening to to heaven. Dante is 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 the the punish is, is the punishment or the gothic horror in in inferno. And we don't see uh, what is interesting talking about space today is that in scholarship in the last 20, 30 years we have witnessed something that scholars term a spatial term and I'm pleased because I remember when I was a young student which was <laughs> I'm afraid 30 years ago I was so interested in maps and space and this was not trendy at all I myself thought that life is full of mysteries time is an amazing mystery but I also thought space is an equally mysterious feature of our life on earth what is space you are there, I'm here. What is the difference between my home and the outside home? Why is a quality, there is a difference in quality in that? And so it seems that there is a great interest now in space. So my, I don't know whether I'm answering your question, but I think uh, that there are um, un, uh, needs, there are some deep needs of human nature that may not be forgotten. They take different shapes. So now we are probably going towards a different um, perception of space and we will, I think, find other ways to break the closed space. I mean, it, it, I, we read Dante because he's a great poem, poet and he still talk to us, I mean, talk to me, as my Dante partner, Professor John Cook in London, keep, keep saying all the time that Dante is a companion. You, you, bring, you eat a panino, cum pane, with Dante. 
nevertheless, this is demonstrating his greatness because his cosmos was not at all my cosmos. I'm, I'm not in the center of the earth. I mean, the, 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 even the, I think it was Pope John Paul II some decades ago that declared that hell is not a place, but a state. But, uh, I think his predecessor would be scandalized to hear that. Well, and, and in fact, we are experiencing, as we said at the beginning, we are experiencing space in a totally different way. I mean, now our map is the tablet we are facing now, and yeah. the experience is that of uh, overcoming space, in a sense, but also being a slave of it, because we cannot go farther away than, yeah. I don't know, I think for each of us, there would probably be different, a different rule to, to follow. And but nevertheless, uh, if I can say, in a, in a way, as perhaps my uh, sympathy for the Middle Ages may, makes me say that, modern cartography, dig, this, this, um, the new digital maps that interact with the uh, viewer, and they are uh, they combine space and time because they may, we have dynamic maps, maps of the weather, even the Google maps, they may, strange enough, from the 19th and 18th century fixed cartography, we, go, we are going back to a kind of medieval approach, maps and to space. Sorry if I interrupted you. No, but I'm, I meant it is absolute. I think it is a, a very open and uh, ever growing field. I mean, visualizing uh, space is <laughs> making sure that we uh, obtain and give the information we actually need or think we need is uh, something that is part of our needs, in fact. So, yeah. I, I think it is great. I think we, we, it is a conversation we should continue. And <laughs> I think uh, we all enjoyed it. I haven't seen other questions coming up. Uh, you're more than welcome to uh, contact us if you have more, uh, if you do have questions about the activities of the Institute. I hope to see you all again uh, uh, later this week. And uh, perhaps we'll meet somewhere else in London or Edinburgh. Uh, everywhere on this imaginary map that we can experience nowadays. So thank you very, very much to you all. And thank you, Professor Scaffi, for being such a wonderful companion. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs>